Good morning, everybody. It is Lunch with Lincoln for Friday, October 29th. It is 11.59 in the East and 8.59 in the West. My name is Reed Galen. I'll be your host today, co-founder of the Lincoln Project. And my guest for the next half hour is the undercurrent.tv's Lauren Windsor. Lauren, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Reed. So Lauren has gotten a lot of, I think, well-deserved attention this week. Um, over the course of the last few days, uh, Lauren and her compatriots have put out a series of videos showing that, uh, I guess, conservative legal mind, John Eastman, a lawyer from California, uh, did not disavow the memo he wrote after last year's election in which he outlined several different ways that both President Trump and Vice President then Pence uh, could delay the counting of electoral votes on January 6th. Um, this was a memo he wrote, again, for circulation in the Oval Office. Uh, he tried to get Senator Mike Lee uh, to sign on to it. And what we saw was, um, and my video's frozen, so Lauren, I'm just going to keep talking, um, that he um, thought that there were ways that they could do this constitutionally. Um, he disavowed it in places like the National Review. Uh, subsequently, um, in these, in these um, interviews with you, uh, at a major event in Orange County, California, he um, actually stood behind them. So tell us a little bit about sort of being in the room and I'll try and get my video fixed. Sure thing. So um, the Claremont Gala, it's their annual gala uh, to raise money for the Institute. Uh, Eastman is uh, employed there as a senior fellow. Uh, we have been looking at this event for a while, and the timing just ended up being incredible given uh, the amount of news that Eastman was generating in the weeks leading up to it. But, you know, we went undercover to the event and talked to Eastman for about eight and a half minutes. The full footage is on YouTube, uh, uncut uh, from the, the beginning to the end of the interaction. And then uh, we have chunk that down into uh, four different clips to make it easier for folks to uh, digest on social media. So if you go to uh, LA Windsor, my Twitter feed, uh, you can see each of the four videos and what, you know, each one of them says is, you know, there's a lot of news in each one. So just dropping it all at once would have, I think, been a disservice to understanding uh, sure. the totality of what John Eastman was involved in. But you know, we asked him at least four different questions about uh, January 6th, and you know, each of his answers, I think, yielded some pretty uh, surprising, surprising results. So, yeah, and and so let's do this. So you had a series of three where he was talking about the memo, but the the clip you just dropped a little while ago talks about, and guys, this is what we've talked about <clears throat> repeatedly, is just how deep uh, and how broad conservative efforts are to really now excise the party of anybody who doesn't believe in the big lie. So Lauren, we're gonna take a couple minutes to watch your latest clip from today. B, why don't we go ahead and roll that? I met, I, I, I Trump, Giuliani and me met with 300 legislators on January 2nd via Zoom conference call. And, and, and they all spinelessly wouldn't do anything, right? Even though we'd given them all the evidence, they wouldn't do it. So, look, I, I would, I very much wish it were otherwise. But I just, these guys are spineless. And, and now, now, if we take a bunch of them out in the primaries in 2022, and the, the precondition for getting elected is we're going to fight this stuff, then maybe we got an opportunity. But right now, I just don't see it. I mean, if so we, how in advance, sorry, Go ahead. But how in advance of 2024, like, how do we stop them from stealing the next election? So, so we've got one of the things that I've seen very encouraging in every precinct across the country, just homegrown, not coordinated people going in and looking at the voter rolls. And, and they're saying, you know, I know that address. And these 28 people don't live there. Right. And there's this and it's it's a combination of transgender men in their girls bathrooms and CRT and the mask mandates and the election fraud. And there are these homegrown um, groups that are just 
self-regulating in their own neighborhoods. And that's happening in every county in the country. And, you know, so instead of two eyes on election day, we're going to have a hundred pairs of eyes at every step of the process. And it'll make it much more difficult. It won't be impossible, particularly on the machine manipulation that goes on behind the scenes. Well, that's what you talked about in your speech, was that, like, there was a folder yeah. of And by the way, votes. I made a mistake. It's not a secret folder. Their own manual calls it a suspense, suspense folder. Their own manual. Everybody's saying, you made that up. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Secret suspense folder. It's the same damn thing, right? I mean, well, I had never heard of that before until you talked about it in your speech, and I was just like, how is this even happening? I know. I know. How are we allowing this election to be stolen from I, us? I know. I know. It's awful. But look, look. We, we don't want yeah. to monopolize all your we time. Got it. We, no, but thank you for all your help. So, Lauren, there's a few things there that are concerning, to say the least. Um, yeah. And I, want, and I want to start backwards. Um, the first is this idea that that he just believes, or he's willing to say out loud that all these vote these voting machines are being manipulated, though there is no evidence of that. Even after the ridiculous thing in Arizona with all that, no one can make the no one can find any evidence of this. Now, this is a guy. Listen, I lived in California for a long time. Eastman has been around for a million years, right? Constitutional scholar, they always call him. Um, so this is a guy who knows better, but he's clearly taken on, you know, the big lie, all of this stuff, because they see it as potent to, you know, uh, ginning up Republicans. He sees it as staying in Trump's good graces. Remember that this guy, John Eastman, was on the stage on January 6th, you know, as the insurrectionists were, you know, marching towards the Capitol. Um, and then you, and then, you know, you mentioned that this was an event for the Claremont Institute. Um, now, the Claremont Institute, in my mind, is, you know, I don't know what the word in 1931 Germany or the or institution in 1931 Germany would have been, but this is a group that, um, you know, they had at an event months ago, J.D. Vance, uh, former anti-Trumper, now full Trumper, running for Senate in, in Ohio, saying that, you know, that anyone who is opposed to the American nation state must be removed from power, and if that's not possible, destroyed. So what was your sense of being in that room? Did these seem like normal people or were they all sort of rabid foaming at the mouth? I'm not sure which is worse, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't, it, the issue I see with um, the insurrection is that the majority of folks think that it's the rioters uh, that were out uh you know, at the Capitol that are the most dangerous. And I actually think it's the people like the uh, folks at the Claremont Institute who are providing intellectual cover for these arguments, uh, basically insurrectionists in suits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, when I spoke with the Claremont's president, Ryan Williams, he was clearly on board with Eastman's work. I mean, he he employs him, he funds him, and he spoke specifically about, you know, John is uh, doing a lot of work still in the states with the state legislators, advise, advising them on, you know, uh, quote unquote, election integrity stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, saying, you know, all that John has uh, said is, look, you know, uh, we need to address uh, what happened in 2020 because there's no moving on, uh, you know, uh, otherwise, uh, they'll can, uh, continue to steal subsequent elections from here on out. So they definitely haven't moved on from 2020. They're finding ways to, uh, subvert future elections. So. Right. And this is, this is, I mean, I think this is one of the key things that we're seeing, um, certainly from Eastman and Claremont, but also, you know, from state attorneys general, um, from, you know, wackadoos from Trump himself, which is reduce the um, belief in the system to its lowest possible point. Um, that fires up your own base. It discourages independent or swing voters. Uh, it, it, you know, Democratic voters might or might not believe it's an issue. So whether or not it affects how they're going to behave you know, whether or not it's Tuesday in Virginia or sometime a year from now. Um, but I thought it was also interesting. He was talking about these these, legis these state legislators who haven't come on board with the big lie need to be primaried. And I'm interested in that because, you know, this is we had this sort of 
astronomical theory of the uh, today's Republican Party, which is it's sort of like this, you know, it started as a as a star and then it went to a red, you know, red giant and it's sort of blown off its outer edges. And now it's this this white dwarf, you know, it's hotter, it's more extreme um, and it's going to start to eat on itself, which is you can only have so many insane people up for office, you know, even in a pretty gerrymandered district before some voters are going to be like, that person's a nut. I want nothing to do with them. Um, so this seems to be a much more, you know, as, as much as, as much as Eastman says it's quote unquote homegrown, we know it's not right. That they're, they're in this place. We saw this with, um, with some of the stuff they've been doing on, um, you know, election integrity things, um, the stuff that they've done on voter, voter repression, right. That the heritage action people said that they, they had what they called sentinels out in the state. So they made it look homegrown. So you're out there on the front lines every day. This sure seems organized to me. From what I can see, it, it seems organized. You know, I think that, you know, we've seen that Americans for Prosperity, the Koch Brothers Network is doing a lot of organizing uh, to prevent the For the People Act, uh, any uh, voter, uh, you know, democracy reforms from being passed. I would imagine that they're uh, funding some of these efforts as, as well. Um, although, you know, I can't definitively, you know, say um, I, I have, you know, researched the Cokes for a number of years and there is reporting on, you know, their opposition to the For the People Act. Uh, Jane Mayer of The New Yorker has uh, broken news on that. But to go back to what you're talking about, uh, getting crazier and crazier and eating your own uh, in the video that we dropped, Yesterday, Eastman uh, blamed Karen Fan for the botched Arizona audit, saying that uh, you know she's one of these people who thinks that Trump is destroying the Republican Party and that she omitted a line from the final report that said that uh, the Arizona results should not have been certified. So I hadn't heard that about Karen Fan before. Uh, my uh, interpretation had always been that she was a pretty, you know, devout, uh, rabid, uh, you know, whatever sort of fervent, uh, fervent maybe is the best word here, right. a supporter of Trump. So, you know, the fact that he's throwing Karen Fan under the bus says something. Well, that's the thing, right? There's the, um, <clears throat> there's that, that line of Steve Bannon's, right? Which is never let anybody get to your right, um, in, in conservative politics anyway. And so the question is, you know, you know, how far to the right can you be before you're, you know, often, you know, I don't know, you know, territory none of us could have imagined, you know, a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, but but here we are. But the other thing that I thought was interesting, and this is, you know, in that last clip we just showed was Eastman talking about, and this is something that we put an ad out about last night, and we'll we'll show it here in a second. We're seeing this in Virginia too, is that a lot of these cultural issues are being ginned up for particularly for the purposes of scaring white suburban voters, throwing culture war bombs at the Democrats that Republicans, you know, have for years done and Democrats aren't good at handling it. He mentioned critical race, uh, you know, critical race theory and all these other things. So it's what what Eastman did and why I think this in the work that you're doing is so, in, in, you know, important uh, is because you're getting these folks to say the quiet part out loud and on camera and it's fascinating to me that when they are in a when they're when they're in their comfort zone, how quickly they're willing to do it. They're just willing to tell anybody, like, guess what we're up to, right? And and I think it's a fascinating exposition of just how loudly the bad guys want to trumpet their badness, um, you know, when when they think that they've got a supporter in their midst. Yeah. He was clearly very enthusiastic uh, about his work, whereas he had not been with the National Review. So that uh, surprised me. You know, going into the evening, I was a little apprehensive that he wouldn't be there, uh, like just because he'd be hiding out. But then knowing that he had formed this new legal group, you know, it's like clearly this guy is defiant. He might not be really out in the media, but, you know, if we can get to him and we can have a conversation with him, you know, he'll probably want to talk about how aggrieved he is. 
And, you know, <laughs> luckily uh, it was the latter. He, he wasn't shell-shocked. He was aggrieved, and he, he definitely wanted to vent about it. Well, yeah, and I mean, look, there's <clears throat> probably few people other in the, you know, in the world who um, love hearing the sound of their own voice more than a guy like John Eastman, right? So all you have to do is sort of start that flywheel spinning, and then he's willing to just go because now he's sort of like, he's got, he's got the ability to really share his thoughts you know, it's behind the scenes. No one's going to know. Um, and now, of course, you know, he's he's made himself a prime candidate for, you know, a January 6th committee subpoena uh, or anything else, because, you know, he was as much as he's a quote unquote constitutional scholar. His memo clearly indicates that he was trying to suborn or subvert American democracy and the rule, uh, you know, the, the will of the American people writ large uh, in a memo trying to f convince Mike Pence uh, to, you know, delay the counting of the electoral votes, which there's no basis in law for that. Uh, but also, you know, the idea that Mike Pence was, quote unquote, too establishment, and that's why he wouldn't go along with this. I mean, I guess if following the Constitution and the law is establishment, it gives you a pretty good indication of where John Eastman and all these these otherwise, quote unquote, intellectuals really are. But I think we also, you know, anytime that we talk about Mike Pence uh, doing the right thing, we need to also caveat that, that, uh, you know, when I talked to Pence a couple months ago in Nebraska, he clearly, uh, the calculus would have changed for him if there were an alternate slate of electors. Uh, you know, he said, you know, when I pressed him on, why didn't you do more to fight for President Trump? You could have stopped this. Like, well, have you read the Constitution? Read the Constitution. Uh, but then he said something really interesting. He said, you know, none of the states put forward an alternate state of uh, slate of electors. And then like the day after we put that story out, the news uh, of him having the conversation with Dan Quayle came out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're having more and more sort of like layers of context that are coming in over this last year. And, you know, obviously we'll get a lot more uh, as the January 6th committee heats up. But that comment says to me that, you know, Mike Pence would have thought differently about stopping it and might have acceded to John Eastman's and Rudy Giuliani's and Trump's and all the other Trumpers that and were you know, bearing, and, yeah. oh, bearing right. down on him to act, you know, he might have acceded to those demands had there been an alternate slate of electors. And we can see here that Eastman's work and Claremont's work is, you know, advising these state legislators, you know, possibly primarying them or, you know, working to primary them so that next time around, they have a more pliable set, uh, set of legislators in place who will put forward an alternate slate of electors. And that scares the shit out of me. No, as well it should, because that's the one thing we noted. You know, we were back east um, about a month ago. You were on the podcast with us. And, um, you know, that was where folks first started saying, you know, you know, we've been talking about being involved in key House races, key Senate races. But people are like, are you looking at these governor's races next year? And, you know, it was something that, you know, we always sort of thought about conceptually, but Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, these are all states that were swing states last year. Uh, they have Democratic governors or Republican governor in Georgia, but thankfully we had a, a secretary of state there, Republican secretary of state who wasn't going to find, you know, 11,343 votes for Donald Trump. Um, but they all have Republican legislatures. And so, um, you know, I was just interviewing uh, earlier today for our podcast. It'll drop, I think, on Monday. Uh, the Repu uh, the, excuse me, the Democratic Attorney General of Michigan, Dana Nessel, um, which is if you have a Republican governor in Michigan and you have a Republican legislature in Michigan, then you could have a situation where, like last year, a Joe Biden or a Democratic nominee wins by 150,000 votes, and the and the Michigan legislature says, well, we've got this alternate slate here because there are Republican electors, right? You're voting for electors when you vote for president, not for that person. These are the electors that represent that candidate. Um, that governor could sign off on that. And now you could have two slates of electors going up to the Capitol. Um, and now you've got Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, having to deal with this. And now we're right now, you know, that's a that's an actual constitutional crisis. And this is the one thing I think, Lauren, I'm interested in is, is do you think that the folks that you're talking to when they realize what they're doing, when John Eastman realizes what he's doing, do you think they understand the Pandora's box 
their opening with this because they can uh, try and achieve a given outcome. That doesn't mean they understand the reaction to what their, you know, their activities might be, right? It's, they should not expect that everybody's just going to sit quietly and say, oh, well, they stole the election from us. I guess we'll get them in the next hundred years. Well, so uh, Steve Bannon certainly knows what he's doing, and he's talked about this for for at least the last decade that I've been in politics is, you know, that he wants to um, incite a civil war. I mean, mm -hmm. he sees this as, you know, being a crisis point that he can help to like agitate along into like the next period of American greatness. You know, he believes in this like fourth turning. Mm -hmm. do, do you know right. the fourth turning thing? Right. Um, so, we were actually at a Steve Bannon event uh, last week prior to the Eastman event, and he talked about the fourth turning. And um, he clearly sees himself as a chaos agent, right. uh, wants to incite these crisis points uh, because he sees it as, you know, the opportunity for sort of like these, I think, uh, right-wing revolutionary forces to seize power and, you know, drive, uh, drive, you know, progressives, liberals, uh, what, you know, he, he's always quick to say, you know, cultural Marxists, um, to drive cultural Marxists out of power. Which uh, is ironic because he considers himself a Leninist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right? Like those, those two things, Marxism, Leninism, you know, maybe it's Marxism, Leninism, Bannonism now. But, but, you know, to call, you know, Biden a cultural Marxist is so laughable. Uh, any of these, you know, the further and further right wing you get, like, you know, these people who are definitively centrist, you know, get painted as, you know, being the, you know, socialist antichrist, the uh, communist antichrist. It's ridiculous. But, you know, you, that's what's really terrible about politics um, as a game is that, you know, it's so much easier to take down your opponent if there's not any nuance, if right. you make everything as polarized as possible and as black and white terms as possible. We're at war. This is the enemy. You know, this is the good guy. And I think Fox has done a really good job of this. Steve Bannon has done a really good job of this. I mean, you know, so much of this originated, you know, with like Nixon and um Roger Stone and Lee Atwater and we're seeing sort of I think the real like zenith of all of that work is um we're hitting it you know all the chickens are coming home to roost so well, like our right and it's and it's the weird thing where you know the modern Republican party is now um you know aggrieved disaffected mostly white voters um, and oligarchs, right? It's a weird combination of people who would never otherwise sit together, certainly want nothing to do with each other at any given moment, right? You know, as much as Elon Musk likes to go on Twitter and, and you know, say things that are inflammatory, like he ain't hanging out with your average MAGA voter anytime soon, right? So like he doesn't want to pay higher taxes, uh, but he's happy to sort of, you know, stoke that, um, you know, anti-tax dogma, right? That, I mean, you go back to, you know, you were mentioning some of the people, but Grover Norquist, right? In the nineties and, and 2000s, single-handedly ensured that no Republican member of Congress or the U S Senate or even legislatures was going to get elected unless they signed his pledge. Um, you know, fiscal responsibility and fiscal, you know, um, uh, you know, being fiscally responsible does not mean no taxes. It means paying for what you can pay for and you know, not doing what you shouldn't do. Uh, but now, you know, Democrats try and do this stuff to pay for, you know, the big stuff that Biden is trying to get done. Republicans scream, you know, you can't, you know, Mitt Romney, well, they're going to buy paintings. Like, what the hell is that? Right? It doesn't make sense to anybody. Uh, but again, again, it just goes to show. Did he actually say that? That they're going to, people are going to buy paintings? He did. Money? He said, if you raise taxes on billionaires, they will stop buying stocks and they will buy paintings and other things uh, that have no, you know, otherwise public value. Right. So, but I guess, would. I guess if, if, if you're someone whose business was predicated on taking on debt, shedding its assets and then selling it off as quickly as you could, maybe we shouldn't be surprised by his, you know, his particular 
perspective on either raising taxes or extending the debt ceiling, but that's not why we're here today. I mean, wasn't our economy at its healthiest when we had, you know, uh, upper tax rates of like 90 percent? You know, I'm not advocating that we tax people uh, at that level. But, no, I mean, that was you know, I mean, that uh, was there's definitely the, got to be. 50, uh, yeah, it looks in the 50s under Eisenhower. The top under Eisenhower, yeah, rate, was 90 percent. Um, and under, it's not like you're, under Carter was 70. I'm not saying we should. Those are confiscatory in some ways. I but, think that people, though, uh, when you hear 90 percent tax rate, because there's so little uh, like financial savvy <laughs> right. um, amongst, you know, just the general public, it's a, that means if you made 90 percent of, $90. you know, all the money that you made, it's, you know, up to a certain dollar amount you get taxed. It's, you know, right. at the lower rates and there's, you know, only a you know, smaller percent percentage of the money that you're taking in that's taxed at that top rate. You know, just people like Google, like marginal tax rates. <laughs> right. But I guess, I mean, that's, that's, that sort of illustrates the point you were trying to make earlier, which is, um, I mean, in politics, nuance is always difficult um, because you rarely have the time, uh, you rarely have the attention, and you rarely have the messenger that can deliver nuance in a way that is impactful. Um, so, it's not surprising that most political messaging is lowest common denominator. I mean, look, we our stock and trade is, you know, punching people in the gut to make them pay attention. Right. I mean, I'd like to say that we could be in the nuance business. Unfortunately, in this period in time, I don't, I'm not sure um, how much of that's going to break through, especially with all the other noise. Uh, totally. I mean, it's just a matter of communication that, you know, having things in as, you know, concise and easy to represent terms. It's going to be the easiest message to convey. Um, but, and, and everyone's so ADD in America uh, with all the various things going on. I'm sorry, what were you um, saying? <laughs> um, you know, it's just, nobody has the time to, to pay attention. No one has time for nuance. And I just wish that we had a sort of a, a revival of civic duty that yeah. people, you know, maybe could commit to 30 minutes at least each week is not a huge commitment. I mean, I would say like if you could devote an hour, but just at least 30 minutes to reading about what's going on in your community at the local level, the state level, the national level and saying like, wow, you know, these issues really do impact me and I should be involved at least in some way more than I right. already am because I don't know how we survive. Well, being part of your community is more than, I mean, it starts with paying your property taxes if you're a homeowner, but it's more than that, right? You actually have to take, you know, a, a step forward to do things, you know, whether or not it's a school board, whether or not it's a Kiwanis club, whether or not, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, those, those things used to be the backbones of local communities uh, as people have moved, you know, as we've become more transient society, people live in a place right? They can, well, this is where I live, but I don't really care other than the fact that I live here, right? Um, so long as my garbage gets picked up and the cops show up, if I call 911 or if somebody comes to put out a fire, that's as much as the community as they see, but that's really the community serving them, not vice versa. But it's a real degradation. And I, I think that's why uh, when conservatives talk about, um, you know, the societal ills uh, that, you know, are have proliferated, it really resonates with people. Um, you know, there's a lot fewer people going to church and I, I'm agnostic, but, you know, church used to be sort of the, I think, community centered or like bringing uh, people together on all these issues. Right. And um, I just think that. Right. I, it was a place where, and I think this is your, this is your larger point about, you know, whether or not it was Walter Cronkite or the church on Sunday, it was people who otherwise didn't agree on things or see the world in the same way had a either common place they could go like church or a common voice like a Walter Cronkite they could listen to. But the point was, is that we were all, you know, there was a common discussion. There was an, a common agenda. Now we have two disparately different agendas. One on one. Well, side I don't, I don't want to romanticize the past because, you know, there are a lot of, uh, oh, sure. I think societal ills of the past. I just well, Lauren, that, I don't know um, why you don't want to make America great again, again. <laughs> I would like to take America forward. So, right. you know, if, if we could actually address the, the, the problems that are plaguing us now, like uh, the impending 
collapse of, uh, you know, many of, you know, societal structures from climate change, you know, it's going to be huge. And, uh, you know, the Republican Party is dead set on uh, doing anything to stop it. Well, I mean, I will just say this is it's funny that I think uh, earlier this year, the Florida legislature passed, excuse me, and I believe Ron DeSantis signed some deal to build a bigger, higher seawall in Miami, but it didn't have anything to do with the rise of ocean levels, right? They called it like civic security or something, right? But like they had to do something so that Miami wouldn't be underwater, but they sure as hell couldn't talk about how the fact that like rising sea levels were the cause. So I think he banned the use of the term climate change. I, I want to say I remember seeing the story he banned the use of the term climate change in any uh, government documents related to it. Right. Well, of course, because that's well, that's a whole other show. But cancel Lauren, culture, but, cancel right. culture. Don't be can don't cancel me, Lauren. Um, so before we go, are you um, canceling me right now? No, not at all. I am putting you on pause though, so that B, we can run, uh, maybe to Lauren's chagrin, a very, you know, a very stark, uh, ad that we're running now in Virginia. Um, there, there's not a lot of nuance here, but, uh, B, let's go ahead and roll it. Why is Glenn Youngkin suddenly talking about critical race theory? Why do you think it is the issue to put your state back in Republican hands? After all. It's not taught in Virginia schools. Not one. We'll tell you why. But first, let's turn the clock back a few years to Lee Atwater, a Republican operative who used race to win elections. You start out in 1954 by saying nothing. By 1968, you can't say nothing. That hurts your backfire. So you say stuff like, well, of course, buzzing, states' rights, and all that stuff. Like Atwater, Glenn is using coded language. Because in 2021, he can't get away with saying what he really wants to say. So if you see Glenn Youngkin talking about critical race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory, make sure to let him know he's not fooling anyone. Any way you look at it, race is coming on the back plane. The Lincoln Project paid for and is responsible for the content of this advertising. So, um, you know, I think that that goes back to, you know, let's just close with this, Lauren, is what Eastman said, right, which is, you know, something like a critical race theory, not taught in any schools, probably taught in, you know, academia somewhere, probably mostly on the coast than anywhere else. Um, but why are they using it? Because they are using it as a wedge between, you know, for white suburban uh, upper educated voters uh, to be concerned that their children are somehow going to be inculcated, as you said, to this cultural Marxism, um, which is horseshit. They're not, um, you know, uh, I don't, you know, I know that 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 uh, you know curricula evolve over time, um, but it's you know it's this is one of those cultural things that I'm sure you're now experiencing in real time that like didn't exist as a problem, but now have been blown up by a very efficient and very effective right wing media uh, organ or organ you know ecosystem, and now it's because it's having electoral outcomes, and I think cultural issues often do. They do indeed. Well, on that note. <laughs> they do indeed. It's like you can open a whole can of worms, but we don't have time. You'll have to have That's me back right. on. We do not have time because it is, uh, we've gone a couple couple minutes past our time. I want to thank Lauren Windsor for joining me. To, uh, follow her on Twitter, L.A. Windsor. Her videos are second to none. The stuff that she and her team are exposing about Republican leaders, Republican elected officials, Republican candidates is absolutely necessary. Will be hugely helpful to everybody's collective work next year. Lauren, I want to thank you for joining me. Thanks so much, Reed. And everybody, we'll see you on Monday. Thanks all.